Welcome to the Reason Roundtable podcast, your weekly libertarian product from the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, friendos. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. We're going to get into the big Apple antitrust case here in a moment. But first, friends, did the price fluctuations of crypto make you seasick? Are you suspicious of the long-term reliability of the index funds and blue chip stocks dominating your 401k? Well, CSN Mint has got some shiny silver coins for you to consider adding to your investment mix. CSN Mint, one of the most trusted names in the numismatic arts, has been providing certified U.S. Mint collectible coins and precious metals for over 20 years. They're practically bullish right now on silver, uh, which is trading for uh, far below its all-time high, despite having plenty of modern industrial applications, electronics, solar panels, medical devices, and so on. CSN Mint can get you your coins, your bullion bars, your collectibles, all with certificates of authentication graded by a third-party professional for purity and origin. If you're going to collect something, might as well be money. So go to csnmint.com roundtable and use the promo code roundtable to get a free silver American eagle. That's a $30 value uh, with your purchase of $75 or more. That's csnmint.com roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right, let's get right into it, shall we? The uh, Attorney General of the United States of America, Merrick Garland, on Thursday announced that the Department of Justice, along with 15 other states, was suing Apple, not the Beatles record label, alas, but rather the people who make most of our smartphones, not Nick Gillespie's, uh, for violating the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Um, Apple, Garland alleged, has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market that it created by using exclusionary anti-competitive conduct, resulting in fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. The company has, in short, consolidated its monopoly power not by making its own products better, but by making other products better worse. Catherine, I see right here on CBS News, so it must be true that, quote, users have long been frustrated by discrepancies when sending messages between Apple and non-Apple products, including lower media quality, diminished editing capabilities, and even different colors for the messages themselves, end quote. I had not uh, been aware of that frustration, though I am admittedly a little bit slow on understanding technology products. Uh, is there indeed a consumer harm underlying all this stuff? And is antitrust law the way to address it? Right. So obviously, um, referencing the green text bubbles as the justification for an antitrust action um, is flatly ridiculous. Uh, I associate myself just this once with a tweet by Ben Dreyfus, uh, who noted this weekend that he um, this has made him a libertarian. This this is the moment. The uh, green text is an antitrust violation is the thing that made him a libertarian. And he correctly notes that what Apple owes to Android users is nothing because they are not its customers. And I think that that is a really uh, it's a pretty legit point. Um, Nick, first of all, and Ben, ben Drive is you should associate more than just once and has been a secret libertarian for a long time. But oh, yeah. um, uh, you are an Android user. Um, and you're also, yes. uh, uh, first Unlike of all, Catherine, you... who is just an Android. Yes. Good. Uh, oh, bravo. Good looking out on you. Can you, uh, Nick, can you tell us, uh, can you do, give us a brief commercial for Androids? Uh, I don't really understand what they are. Yeah, they are uh, <laughs> for the same money. They're cheaper and you get a much better phone with more capabilities. Uh, the one thing I want to point out to Merrick Garland, who Ooh. is an idiot, is that- Look in the camera and point. I am. I'm trying to. I'm not sure where the camera is now. Matt. You know, there there are cameras all over my apartment. Like I'm never Android sure user. which one is on. Uh, no, but the uh, you know on the Android system, I have a, uh, uh, a Samsung phone. Uh, you know, on the Verizon network, my text bubbles are green, and I am happy to have them as green. So the idea. Um, I really don't know a single person who gives a flying fuck about what color a text bubble is, and I don't care, uh, you know, that I could pay more money to get an iPhone. This, I mean, it's just, it's 
an absurd uh, case, and it exemplifies everything that is wrong with Joe Biden's approach to the economy. I suspect we'll be talking about other minions in his administration uh, later in the show, but this is the type of thing. Apple has a 60% market share in the United States for smartphones. Um, and, uh, you know, globally, Android phones are bigger uh, and more used. This is a such a nothing burger. And if your attorney general is focusing on stuff like this, they are just being anti-capitalist or they have some bone to pick um, that is not quite visible or is the actual cause of action here. This is absurd and it should it should cause a mass defection from everybody who's not an idiot when it comes to supporting somebody like Merrick Garland or for that matter, Joe Biden. Um, Peter, just to counter Mr. Gillespie here. Uh, uh, Dr. The, the, Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie here. There has been a lot of what have been called conservatives. <laughs> this is literally a headline I read this morning of, uh, <sighs> of people who like uh, Lena Khan uh, because uh, there, there's an in increased national conservative uh, interest in antitrust and, and uh, using the, the big stick against uh, Silicon Valley. Google has also come under uh, some antitrust uh, excitements under the Biden administration. If I'm not correct, a little bit under the Trump administration as well. Is uh, laissez-faire America becoming more like dirigist Europe these days, Peter? Well, to start with, I just want to say that while I'm not a conservative, I do think the wrath of Khan is mm. the best Star Trek film, and I, I'm a, a Khan Terry. No, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have um, I think uh, I, another thing You're I think here- You're a real Khan. You're a contrarian. That's right there, <laughs> That's guys. That's it. I'm a con, contrarian. A oh, cunt. my goodness. Thank you, Catherine, as always. Thank the you, best Nick, editor here. There is a real sense in which the United States is following Europe's lead here. Europe has passed a whole bunch of tech regulations. And what you see with a, with a lot of them is that they fly under the, you know, the banner of, you know, we're going to help consumers. This is just about making the market more fair and more competitive. But what they're actually doing is just giving bureaucrats the power to play product designer. And that is exactly what is happening here with the Biden administration suit against Apple. They've decided that they don't like how Apple has designed their products. That is the core contention here. Oh, Apple! Wait, you should uh, your iMessage should be uh, it. It should it should work. Um, it, it should have exactly the same capabilities when it, you're talking to Google users. It's just it's it's incredibly petty, small ball stuff. Uh, and and I mean, like it it seems to work from the presumption. You know, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but that like the green bubble is something like a human right. You know, like DoorDash. It's not. I mean, don't be crazy here, right? It's it's just kind of nutty. There's a there was a an exchange. Uh, in an NPR report on this that I thought was really telling. So you've got the the host who's asking NPR tech correspondent Derek Kerr about, uh, you know, what the what the, the harms are here. He says, well, you know, so the Justice Department has given the example of, you know, you might not get that green bubble if you're not on the iPhone. So how else has Apple made the user experience worse for other people? And the tech correspondent for NPR responds, well, you know, iMessage in iPhone is a good example. If you're not an iPhone user, you're basically locked out of having a fun experience because you will not see those fun stickers like the heart or the thumbs up. And remember, this is the world that young people live in. Justice Department says when Apple designs its products this way, it's basically locking people into the iPhone family. The hearts and the stickers and the green bubble, they're, they're making a federal case out of that. It's just bonkers. I also they love should make the federal case out of you can't plug in the, your your headphones anymore, right? That's. I like, mean, whatever you we, say, Grandpa. You in fact no. can. You just need the dongle. By a little adapter. Um, no, I mean the thing that blows my mind about this is that there are people from the Justice Department, from the FCC, they are looking straight into the camera and just saying, "The Microsoft case was a huge success, and we're going to do it again." Right. So this is this is a wild historical counterfactual like the idea that somehow antitrust action gave us the competitive ecosystem that we have today in terms of technology is is just flatly untrue um the a mostly idea... failed antitrust action to be clear right 
And, you know, the idea that uh, that this is, you know, as Peter said, the idea that this is like worthy of the attention of, uh, you know, this level of details worthy of the attention of uh, um, kind of what will end up being a, you know, billions of dollars of uh, of the great legal minds of our government. Um, I listen to the Motley Fool podcast sometimes uh, because I'm attempting to be a little bit less stupid about the markets. And um, what they said about this this morning, I thought was pretty good, which was they just said, hey, Apple's going to make this go away with money and time. Um, and Apple has a lot of money. They just have a ton of money laying around uh, as a general matter. And um, that what the real cost will be is that they're going to be distracted by this extremely complex, extremely expensive, extremely lengthy, lengthy uh, regulatory action. And um, they're not going to they're going to be less innovative. And that that's a huge problem for this company, which, you know, customers expect a certain amount of uh, whiz bang innovation, I guess. Um, I would certainly like to see the next cool thing that Apple is doing and not have them be distracted by this. Um, you know, this is this is like a very, very, very direct illustration of the trade offs that this type of of antitrust action or other regulatory interference has, which is that. A lot of smart people at this company spent this whole week and many months before and will spend many years after worrying about, you know, what Jonathan Cantor has to say instead of how to make the next cool thing that's going to make our lives better. We should talk just a little bit more about that Microsoft comparison because if you go back to the Microsoft case, the Justice Department's argument was that Microsoft had uh, basically a monopoly on desktop soft OS software and had used that monopoly to push their own internet browser, Microsoft Explorer. At the time, they had about 80% of the market. Apple has in the United States about 60, 65 percent of the smartphone market. So that's a that's a big share. But what the Justice Department has done is that they've made up a kind of a fake stat where uh, Apple has 70 percent of the I can't and they remember call what it, it's like the fancy schmancy yes, smartphone it's category. The elite phone or the, the business <laughs> phone. But yes, that is exactly what it is. There is, the fancy there phone is a, category. a further element of this, which is cultural. And I, I'll I'll explain it to you apple users people who use apple products and i have an ipad and I, you know my first uh, one of my first big jobs out of uh, college was actually working on an early mac system for the publisher of mac user etc but apple people think the whole world exists in apple universe and that you know everybody is desperate to be an apple user etc and Nobody fucking cares. If you like Apple products, you buy Apple products. If you don't, you buy Android, you buy, you know, Google, you buy Windows, et cetera. Uh, and you buy things, uh, you know, even uh, Kindle, uh, which is its own version of, of an Android operating system and things like that. This is such a high functioning market where where winners and losers are pretty fluid. They go up and down. There's a lot of innovation. And to you know to uh, kind of underscore Peter's point, if 60% of the U.S. smartphone market for Apple is enough to trigger some kind of antitrust action, uh, Windows still has a 55% market share of computers, of uh, uh, PC, you know, of uh, uh, desktop and notebook computers. So then this means. The next action will be another case against Microsoft, which nobody is pretending is dominating and and destroying markets, you know, through its monopoly power. I mean, these are functioning markets, and if if you know they if Merrick Garland is going after this kind of stuff, it's just like it's a sign of just absolute stupidity. Nick, you and I are old enough to remember the Microsoft trial in real time and to have forgotten it now because of the decrepitude of age. Um, are there any other lessons from that, even just of the political economy of the thing or technology or anything else that you can recall from those bad old days when you were writing uh, uh, very presciently uh, and uh, incisively about that case? I, you know, I'll, I'll point people and we'll throw it in the show notes to a, a piece from the early 2000s called Antitrust Biggest Hits um, or Greatest Hits. And it is that when you look back at the major antitrust cases, the Microsoft case was going on that, but things like Alcola and uh, Standard Oil and whatnot, they were predicated on- before Microsoft. Yeah, they were predicated on some level on, you know, suggesting that consumers were being harmed. And when you go back and look at it in real time, that is never actually the case. What, what you ultimately see are textbook examples of regulatory capture and politically motivated actions 
uh, because certain types of companies have at certain points bought enough influence with the government to kind of try and force an outcome that they want. Um, and it almost never actually results in better consumer outcome, which you know, is the standard of most antitrust actions. And that is the one that Lena Khan and Tim Wu and a bunch of other people are very influential in antitrust actions are working to uh, delegitimize as the, as, as the standard by which things go. Catherine, but, you know, wasn't it good to break up AT&T? Uh, so there are a couple differences between um, Apple and AT&T. I think our uh, our regular listeners probably already know many of them. Uh, not least, Apple really has not benefited at all from any kind of government coddling. Um, and AT&T did uh, spectacularly. Um, there's, you know, I know that there's, you know, there's always going to be a very complicated relationship between any large company and regulators. But uh, Apple kind of is dominant in the marketplace mostly because it makes uh, it makes good good products to the extent that uh, that Nick disagrees. Uh, we can fight it out in that marketplace. No, I I'm, what I'm but, saying is no, like people who love it, love it. Yeah, um, it's, it's but, great. You know, I think the, the other thing that's at, you know, at question here is. Um, one of the accusations is like, okay, well, Apple is keeping people out of its ecosystem, right? Like there, there are various ways in which they are saying, hey, um, and their justification is, well, it's it's for privacy, it's for security, it's to kind of ensure quality. We want to keep some people outside of our, and I swear to God, if I hear the phrase walled garden again, I'm going to burn the whole thing down. But Why not um, a walled prison? You know, let's be, uh, let's be honest. My, the as Apple long as drugs can come in and out, Nick, that's fine. Uh, the Shawshank Redemption, but for Apple. But at the same time, we have this kind of big movement to, um, you know, to uh, draw down from Section 230 to um, to kind of make it what will functionally make it harder for companies to do this kind of gatekeeping to, you know, to figure out the correct balance between, OK, we're going to let everyone on here, but we no longer have protections from liabilities because we're going to you know, eliminate Section 230. But also, if you do try to put walls up around, you're going to trigger an antitrust action like it. We are making it impossible to function as a tech company in this country, which like one of the best things we've ever done is incubate and encourage the big tech companies that now dominate our economy. And in fact, if you look back at the history of antitrust cases, what you see is not that antitrust was successful, but in fact, that tech is a super competitive marketplace where new developments give companies an edge and uh, and you see competition happen even in places where people say it couldn't possibly happen. Again, the Microsoft case is such a good example here because that case sort of ultimately more or less went nowhere. Uh, and then Microsoft ended up becoming not the the kind of giant monopoly company that could not possibly be dislodged from the marketplace that the DOJ said it was going to be. And why did that happen? It didn't happen because somebody else came in and built a slightly better uh, desktop OS with a slightly different uh, you know internet browser. It happened because of smartphones. It happened because Microsoft uh, missed out on the next wave of technology. The biggest, the closest thing we probably have to a monopoly over the last 10 or 15 years in big tech isn't Apple and its smartphones, but is it's Google and its search market, which it really does control a lot of the search market, especially in America. But where is Google losing market share to? Where, where What is threatening Google's dominance right now? Open AI, which is in part owned or at least invested in, uh, Microsoft has a bunch of money in this, Open AI, which is going to make traditional uh, web crawling search a uh, Along the lines that Google has uh, that Google has done well with, it's going to make it less successful, less valuable to Google. And what we are what we see every time is that the antitrust folks think, well, this is a static market; nothing else will ever happen, and therefore the big company we have to take them down with the power of government. And yet every time some new development that the regulators, the bureaucrats, the antitrust folks they didn't think of, that new technology comes along and dislodges the old player because competition actually works. Nick, I'm just uh, having a, a quick flashbacks to uh, the late '90s when Microsoft owned Slate. Yeah. That? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no. You then, guys forget, uh, but MSNBC, AOL. 
What's the MS in MSNBC? Yeah. I can't imagine. I don't know why they keep it, you know, but uh, they do. Matt, uh, the mention of walled gardens, and I think you'll appreciate this, although I know that Peter and Catherine will not, but um, Thanks, you got to listen to. No, no, I, I mean, because you, you're, you are wiser to have avoided this in your mental uh, locked box upstairs uh, the, the song <laughs> the song my social um, mind fund. gardens by uh david crosby on the birds younger than yesterday album which is this droning piece of shit about a where david crosby builds a walled garden and doesn't mm -hmm. let the sun shine in and it's like the the nadir of all of hippie culture um it is so good and so bad and What's funny about it, though, is the guitar sound shows up all over the Velvet Underground record as well. Um, let's all just try to take a moment and recover from all of those images. Yeah. Um, let's move on to a, a philosophical uh, question, which is to say, uh, if Washington produces a $1.2 trillion spending package and nobody really pays attention to it, uh, except for a couple of backbenchers in uh, the GOP in Congress, uh, did it really happen? Um, this is suggested because uh, over the weekend, uh, President Joseph Robinette Biden the second signed uh, our latest last minute trillion dollar spending stop gap, which will get us uh, through all the way to about six months from now, um, which is an excellent time to be um, uh, re uh, addressing this thing two months before or a month before the uh, presidential election. Uh, bill passed 74 to 24 in the Senate, uh, 286 to 134 in the House, where, of course, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson is facing threats of being removed from the likes of Marjorie uh, Taylor Greene. Uh, uh, Peter, uh, isn't she just Marjorie Taylor now? This I don't know. Are you I dead can't. naming her, Matt Welch? I uh, would hope so. That is okay. my role in life. She dropped and the green in solidarity with Android users who don't have the green <laughs> yeah. bubble. They you do. think like I when think she bubble, got divorced? It's the blue that's all. bubble that people want. It doesn't. Matter. Um. Anyways, Peter, uh, can you tell us what the hell is and is not in this bill, if you have any idea, uh, and uh, how many thousands of years we are from the good old days of 2011? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're so many millenniums. We're we're like counting in Dune time, right? Like at the beginning of every time Princess Irulan or whatever the hell her name is comes on in Dune 2, she's like, the year is 10,472. And that is how I feel reading the news about the budget. Uh, so the, the quote from uh, Chuck Schumer after he passed this thing was just incredible. It's been a long day, a long week, a very few long months, but tonight we have funded the government. That's more or less. I really was hoping he was going to say tonight. Let it be low and brown. <laughs> yeah, that's basically how I feel every time we tape a podcast, except it's only Monday morning. Oh, this is a one point two trillion dollar bill. And it is. You guys have heard of an omnibus and you've heard of a cromnibus. This is a minibus. It's like the short bus of budget bills. Uh, the people, the people listening to this wow. podcast, remember the short, short bus. bus used to be an insult. Sure. Kind of yeah. can't say that now, but like, yeah, this is now the short bus lifestyle. of budget bills, and it has uh, a half a dozen of the appropriations bills all rolled into it. And there's a bunch of stuff, and it's basically exactly what we would have gotten had they not gone through the rigmarole of getting rid of of Kevin McCarthy last year. It doesn't really cut spending in any meaningful way. The biggest wins for the Republicans uh, that they're claiming are that they have slightly defunded uh, the uh, some of the nonprofit aid groups that work with immigrants. And then they also cut a little bit of the bonus IRS funding that uh, the Biden administration gave to the IRS to do enforcement. However, the IRS says this will absolutely not change their enforcement in any way. All they're going to do is spend the money faster and they will be out of the money and it'll be up for sort of a, another vote a little bit faster as a result. So the big wins for the Republican Party here. Uh, this was a, a great process, guys, all around. Uh, Nick, are we out of money yet? I guess we're not. No, you so can always print more. You can always print more, Matt. We're, we're in this, uh, you know, bizarre uh, experiment. That's coming true. So, uh, you know, part of the uh, issue here is that uh, the government is going to keep spending and the Republican, the 
the the part of the Republican Party that wants to shut down the process needs to actually come forward. I mean, I wish they would do this, uh, come forward with a budget and insist on it and voting on it and things like that. They're ne you're never going to win uh, by just trying to say no and force another show, uh, you know, a government shutdown that will end up in more things being spent down the road. And, you know, part of the, the largest issue here is we are just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic anyway, when we're talking about this stuff, because all the action or most of the action, you know, a larger percentage of government spending than Apple has of the smartphone market is in stuff that is never being discussed in, in the annual appropriations process, and that needs to change. That's a tease for a soon-to-come segment on this very podcast. Catherine, uh, the Congressional Budget Office is always sending out death porn that we talk about from time to time, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, you know, just a massive debt overhang and debt apocalypse that we face. And there's long been um, economic literature suggesting that such huge amounts of debt service depress GDP. And yet here we are. The United States is, again, kind of leading the industrialized world in economic growth. Like nothing can stop us. So maybe we're all wrong, Catherine. I mean, even if uh, nothing can stop us, we could we could still be doing better. Like, I think that this is one thing that people sort of, um, because we have so much political rhetoric about like beating other countries in terms of, you know, in economic terms, like we're, we have to beat China is something that both Biden and Trump say all the time. Um, and, you know, when we, when we see all those, when we see all those upward trending lines and the U.S. is at the top, we're like, great, we did it. No need to, no need to examine this any further. Um, that's exactly wrong. We absolutely are making all kinds of trade-offs, including just basic functionality in Congress because of, among other things, the cost of debt service. Um, this is, this is not, you know, this is not something that's like, well, this line's going up, so let's ignore it. It's all fine. Um, I, can I can I read a quote from uh, which is not quite as good as the Schumer quote, but a, a quote from like the victory press conferences on the Hill. So this is Patty Murray, uh, who is the, oh, the, the uh, mother the in tennis the, shoes, the Democratic chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. And she said, make no mistake. Oh, good. Oh. <clears throat> we had to work under very difficult top line numbers and fight off literally hundreds of extreme Republican poison pills. Oh, wow. hyper MAGA. Like this, this the is tide pods of legislation. The tide pod, yeah. like she's just being wow. pelted with handfuls of poison pills by Marjorie Taylor. But Green. she won, and it, it turned out it really was St. Patty's Day. And oh, <laughs> wow. I, can't, I can't do it anymore. The, the laughter really sells it, Peter. I can't. Yeah. Um, but this, I mean, this is the kind of attitude that everyone's going in with, right? Is like any any Republican priority is a poison pill. Any Democratic priority is a you know uh, unfettered spending, a uh, happy pill, a happy <laughs> pill, and um, and no wonder that we can't do anything at all uh, with any seriousness with respect to the debt. It's almost like the government is bad at making things function well, and yet here they are with both the budget and the iPhone. Yes. Uh, all right, we're going to get to I, our list. I want to just register. I have a sense of dread now every time Peter starts talking that it's going to end <laughs> in a kind of cataclysmic sure dad joke if you that meant is like a your high sense speed of wreck. dread was about like the fate of the United States as a polity yeah, no, or just like, like what was going to happen in the next sentence. That is, I, yeah, it's totally I that. aim to yeah. strike fear into the hearts yeah. of my enemies. Uh, Nick, my only... Uh, uh, question to your observation is uh what took you so long um all right so we're gonna get to our listener email of the week here in a moment but first a reminder that this episode is sponsored by better help friends what's the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour each day maybe send out those thank you notes for christmas uh maybe exercise for the first time since hector was a pup Maybe spend a lot more time on Twitter uh, making really, really bad puns. Well, uh, therapy can actually help you prioritize things that are important to you so that time becomes less of an excuse for you to procrastinate instead of doing the work. 
That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy-to-use, super-flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this here podcast clean up brain clutter in order to boldly face life's actually important challenges. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist. Don't like the first one, just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you make your days longer in a good way with BetterHelp. Just visit betterhelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Related question from the previous uh, uh, topic uh, it comes from uh, Barney uh, Benner, who definitely did not bring up ends to the beanery. Uh, Barney writes, and a reminder to everybody, uh, send your emails to roundtableatreason.com. Uh, Barney writes, uh, I keep hearing y'all call social security an entitlement, but seems as though the definition of entitlement would be receiving something that you have done nothing to deserve. Nick and I, he's writing this, uh, are the last of the baby boomers born in 1964, and I have resented the theft from my paycheck for 45 years. I agree that we as a nation have been screwed by the Ponzi scheme of Social Security, but I also feel I deserve the money I paid in. I also know that my money was used to support those before me, but in a business perspective, I have the right to the money I paid in. Write me a check. I'll forgive what I could have received in interest by anyone with half a brain. Your thoughts Please, I will just uh, cut in quickly. I hear this whenever I use the word entitlement. People get mad, and I always just use it as the you are entitled to it legally. Um, although Nick might have uh, a rejoinder to even that description. Nick, what say you as uh, besides just the Generation Jones erasure happening in this? Scene? I uh, I feel his pain uh, tremendously, um, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is you're not entitled legally to your Social Security. Uh, there was a 1960 case, Fleming v. Nestor, which involved a Bulgarian immigrant who was deported after it became clear that he had belonged to the Communist Party and had lied on his uh, entry into the country. But he sued after he was deported to uh, get his Social Security. And uh, the court said nobody has an expectation. It's not a property right. Like, you don't own it. Um is it realistic that the government will like massive, you know, on a, on a mass level, not pay out Social Security when they don't have to anymore or they don't want to? That's unlikely, but it's important. We, we don't have a right to it. That, and that should add to the anger over the ridiculousness of Social Security um, and the fact that it is it does not make enough money to cover its payouts um, and it needs to stop. And I would say to Barney. Um, again, I feel the pain. I would be happy if this would provoke a political solution. I'm willing to walk away from it, uh, you know, and and just like be like, okay, just stop stop taxing me for it, and I don't get anything. That's the trade that I'm willing to take because otherwise, I don't think there's a way to do that. Uh, the current benefit in um, 2024, uh, the the average payout, which is distinct from the median, obviously, but it's about $1,900. I would much rather see if we are going to have trans mass transfer programs, uh, have that money go to people who are poor and who need temporary assistance or temporary help or even long-term help uh, and get rid of old age requirement, uh, old age entitlements, period. Uh, they were passed, you know, first with Social Security and the Depression when being old meant you were likely to die. Uh, and you didn't have retirement. And then with Medicare, which was called the last act of the New Deal by LBJ and its other um, big proponents, uh, times have changed. And well, old people are wealthy people and they should be funding their lifestyles accordingly. And it's going to be ugly, uh, but we need to have an actual shift point where we say, okay, this system, whatever, however it might have functioned in the past, it no longer is relevant to what we are now. And we need to change how we do this. Um, Catherine, are you going to be marching on the uh, National Mall with a uh, get your statist hands off my Social Security sign? Absolutely. I've already got it. I've already got some poster board and some Crayola markers. I'm ready to go. Crayola, um, by the way, 80 percent of the uh, non-toxic oh crayon. Don't tell marker. Lena Khan. Yeah. She's going to yeah. come for my my box of 64 yeah. uh, colors. Um <laughs> It's got that's the one with a little sharpener in the back, yeah, which is, you know, so that's wonderful. the kind yeah. of special perk that only oh Crayola yeah. users get, which is, you know, if you think about it, 
basically a crime. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, you know, in the Republican budget plan, the initial Republican budget plan, there was this idea maybe they were going to just try again to raise the age of Social Security eligibility by a couple of years. Everybody panic. Um, like it was, you know, this is I don't think that our letter writer has to worry because the spectacular unseriousness of the U.S. Congress uh, in dealing with this question, like payouts will be continuing to people Nick's age, to people, people the letter letter writer's age, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah, the question, the question, uh, I think, is still a little bit more of a live one for younger folks. And of course, I would love to see a system where we could um, opt out of, uh, as Nick says, opt out of paying in, maintain our own retirement accounts, whatever it is. Um, there are so many better options. But you know, the fact is, I I pay taxes, and and everyone pays taxes for lots of things that we are entitled to in the conventional sense that we don't receive, like a good public education. Uh, many, many people pay dutifully pay their taxes and don't have a functional school that they can you know, feel comfortable sending their kids to. I don't know, like roads, uh, you know, more <laughs> roads. Uh, you know, they're, they exist. They're full of potholes that might, for example, take you out and break your knee. This is, you know, this is these are basic expectations. These are entitlements, again, in the conventional sense that we are supposed to have because we are taxpayers. Um, we're not going to get them. It doesn't matter whether you feel you deserve them. Um, the government is bad at providing these services and they are going to be particularly bad, I think, at paying off um, you know, anything that looks remotely like the promises that were made about Social Security to younger people. But honestly, the letter writer is probably fine. So I guess congratulations to him. She said uh, bitterly. Peter, <laughs> uh, Peter, I was kind of surprised to read the news from, I think, last week that the Republican Study Committee, one of those things uh, in the on Capitol Hill, um, did in fact come out and say, yeah, we should maybe extend a year or two um, uh, the uh, the time when people start getting their uh, Social Security monies. Um, what uh, I'm surprised just because the modern GOP led by Donald Trump has made running against any kind of tweaking to entitlements um, central to their worldview. Uh, what did that tell us, if anything, about uh, where Republicans are in seriousness about even acknowledging the cruel, cruel math that used to be a just a bipartisan no brainer was a problem that needs to be fixed in the future? Well, do recall that the Republican Study Committee is one of the more conservative organizations, collections of Republicans on Capitol Hill. And so what they say isn't necessarily what the entire party believes. I think the thing that I would want to stress to the letter writer here is that if you got all the money that you paid into Social Security, if they just wrote you a check that is equal to the dollar value, that would be far less than the expected value of your Social Security entitlement payout. Uh, almost certainly, uh, because that is true for the vast, vast majority of beneficiaries. And so you see these polls, I think Reason may even have done some at, at some point where you ask people, well, would you be okay with Social Security if you just got the money that you'd paid in back? And people say, yeah, but then you tell them that's going to be a lot less than the Social Security that you would have gotten under the current system. They're like, oh, wait, I'm not sure I support that. But that gap, the fact that the amount that you paid in doesn't equal the amount that Social Security owes you under its payment scheme, that is the problem is that there's not enough money in the system to pay for Social Security's obligations. And Social Security and healthcare costs, and uh, in part because of the changing demographics with more people uh, living longer and uh, after retirement, those are the biggest drivers of the long-term debt. And so if you want to take the take a pulse of the Republican Party and where it's at on this stuff, uh, I would actually point you to what Speaker of the House Mike Johnson said on CNBC last week, where he said, you know, he would he would support a fiscal commission to take a look at doing something about the debt just so a long commission. as it doesn't just so long as that commission took off the table at the beginning, raising taxes or doing anything to entitlements. I, too, support losing weight without uh, in any way changing my diet or my exercise. That sounds great. But that's basically what he's proposing. The, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is Social Security benefits, uh, they both keep going up and then they keep getting kind of dinged because you actually end up paying tax on a lot of Social Security income or more than you used to. Uh, over the past three years, in 2022, the COLA, the cost of living adjustment for Social Security, was 8.7% 
It was 5.9% last year, and this year it's going to be a mere 3.2%. So it goes up, but then you get, you know, you get taxed on it, uh, and then it causes a bigger imbalance that Peter was talking about. And the, the real kicker is every couple of years, the amount of income that is subject to Social Security taxes goes up. It's currently around 160 grand, which is a lot of money. And it used to top out, you know, like a hundred thousand dollars, one hundred and ten thousand. So, what um, you know, and the retirement age goes up by a month or two for each year, um, you know, that you retire up to sixty nine. Um, so, we're going to get squeezed. And the question is, do we want to try and like keep maintaining a really leaking boat and a rickety ship or whatever metaphor you want to use that is? really falling apart and is not doing its primary function anyway, which is providing for a retirement for old people? Or do we want to admit that, okay, we've learned from this experiment and it's a teardown and we need to build a different system to help people who need it uh, You know, going forward into the 21st century? Between this and the Titanic reference, I think what Nick is telling us is that he is ready to go on his like retirement cruise. Like he's yeah, I he's out of here. He wants to as be long in the as it's line. not a reason cruise. Okay, R.I.P. the reason cruises. Yeah. I never got to go on one. Oh wow! I'm gonna ask. So Sora, that's part of us didn't a... come back from that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Sora to create a version of that. I'm on a boat music video, but with Nick instead. No. <laughs> Please that could be that. our outro for this yeah. week's podcast. I, I cannot beg you sincerely enough to yeah. please not do that. <laughs> uh, the letter writer Barney's uh, uh, spirit of it, I think, was sort of like a personal conception of all these kind of things. And F W I W, um, my personal mm -hmm. conception, being a Gen Xer, I'm 55 now, is has always been and has not changed. I don't expect to get one dollar. I'm, I'm living my life, planning my you, life you as believe, if I will never get any money. You believe in UFOs more than you believe in the uh, security of Social Security, right, Matt? That was UFOs, the big Gen X talking point. UFOs are not about belief. Are there uh, unidentified flying okay. objects? By definition, yes. Yeah. By definition, yes. It's right. not belief. It's just fact. Looking forward to next week's question from UFO enthusiasts yeah. <laughs> asking you to expand yeah. on that. <laughs> What are we no. calling them now? Unexplained no, uh, uh, aerial blah, phenomena. Blah, blah, UAP. U UAPs. Yeah. U UAP. UAP. Unexplained aerial phenomena. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, anomalous. I, Actually, it's anomalous, maybe? Oh. Anyway. Mm. Uh, they have to be, in the be They could be they, on yeah, the ground. I guess they could be in the ocean. Sorry, Matt. Should the Loch Ness Monster pay Social Security taxes? Uh, that's why you should watch Ancient Apocalypse to find out the uh, okay. answer to these and other right. important questions. Yeah, Let's... that's really like dog whistling the conspiracists <laughs> so hard these days. <laughs> Let's go to the drama that's actually getting attention in political headlines today. As we tape this, and yes, we do tape it. Uh, former President uh, Donald Trump is in a Manhattan courtroom, roughly halfway between me and Nick. Uh, trying one final Hail Mary uh, to get his uh, Stormy Daniels hush money criminal case thrown out of court. That case, which is brought by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, uh, may well be the only one of the four criminal cases that Trump is facing that will get uh, uh, make it to trial before the November election. Yet the real drama, arguably, is that today is also the deadline for Trump to post a mind-boggling $454 million bond imposed upon him by New York State Attorney General Letitia James as part of the civil asset valuation case that he lost a few weeks ago. He's already posted a $91.6 million bond to appeal his penalties in the defamation case that he lost, a uh, suit that he lost to E. Jean Carroll over alleged sexual assault. Uh, Letitia James has said she's ready to start seizing his assets, including maybe starting first with Trump Tower. Uh, hopefully oh, she's like starting with Barron. That's what I understand, man. <laughs> Six foot seven worth of assets. Uh, uh, Trump's other son, uh, Eric, I believe, uh, the smart one, has said that the whole uh, lawfare effort amounts to election interference. Catherine, certainly this does look like some pretty disproportionate dollar amounts that could put a pretty huge crimp on the fundraising of a major party presidential candidate. No? 
Yeah, I mean, this is uh, like the the numbers with respect to various Trump bonds and like legal obligations are now they're starting to like cause that same humming sound in my head that like the national debt causes like that when the numbers get big enough, it's just like, oh, God, I can't hear these anymore. Um, One million is big. One billion is bigger. I, w- I now long for the humming sound. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's been interesting to me because uh, I have, uh, I think many people at Reason have like a quite strong view that campaign finance regulations as a general matter, both are um, ineffective and probably unconstitutional. But we are really uh, like, this is testing some of my intuitions on that since Trump is pretty explicitly just fundraising for his presidential campaign by saying, I have to pay, I have a lot of legal expenses that I have to pay. Um, And also vice versa, that he's saying, you know, um, I was planning to use the cash that that is, of course, what the courts would seize first, right? Like the very first thing that they go after is not Trump Tower. It's just whatever sitting around in your bank accounts. That's very easy to do because, of course, banks uh, have already long since worked out procedures where they just take all the money in your bank account and transfer it to the attorney general or whoever. Um, he's saying, you know, I need to use that cash for my presidential campaign. Um, and so um, the the sort of total uh, bleed between those two piles of money, uh, on the one hand, I think it should be legal. I think it's uh, I think it's crazy to um, to tell someone, for instance, that they uh, that they if they're if they're straight with uh, with their fundraising, if he says I'm going to use this for my legal expenses, he should be allowed to do that. Um, if people want to give him their money to spend for his legal expenses, they should be allowed to do that. But um, but yeah, I you know I I think at the heart of it there is it is still legitimate to ask like did the court make this number so big? Did the judge make this number so big? In an explicit effort to handicap a presidential campaign, that's a fair question to ask. I think it, the answer I would I would guess is is a complicated one. But um, we talked, I think, on a previous podcast about like the the way at which the way in which that number was arrived at. It was like fairly unorthodox. It was it was you know somewhat unusual for the way that courts typically process these type of claims. So I think it's P- fair to ask. Peter, with uh, both Letitia James and Alvin Bragg, we're talking about um, elected. Uh, officials, Democratic elected officials, uh, who uh, ran explicitly, at least in the case of Letitia James, and I'll presume Bragg, um, uh, explicitly they're going to go after Trump. And they've acted like, you know, end zone spiking clowns on social media uh, as part of this whole process. Given those numbers, given the behavior, given the partisan nature of it all, is this election interference? What an incredible shit show. Like, seriously, this whole thing, it just makes me, like, want to quit everything. Uh, there's So is it election interference? I don't think that it is election interference as classically defined. I think it is boorish and stupid behavior on the part of just about everyone involved. I hate them all. This is an aliens versus predator situation. Whoever wins, we lose. That's uh, an uncommonly uh, brief. Uh, Nick. Uh, is there an element to this where Republicans are getting what they deserve? Uh, Trump is a known quantity. He's going to be in the legal system regardless. Even if he wasn't president, there'd be a thousand lawsuits going in and out. He's always done that. He's always stiffed his contractors. He's always like made himself look 12 times larger than he actually is. Um, is there a part of this where Republicans have it coming? Uh, yes, but Matt, you buried the lead as you are wont to do on Monday mornings because over the weekend, the real Trump news was that he won uh, at the award nights the club championship and trophy and the senior club championship <laughs> trophy. I won both, he write, wrote on Truth Social. Uh, he won at the Trump International Golf Club in West Palm Beach. He won the big awards, Matt. I, mean, I don't know why you're trying to cover that up with this, you know. I don't see you winning the bullshit. Nick Gillespie invitation. In Wars. fact, I, I noted I this charge. morning that I continue to, I am the only voter in the Nick Gillespie Awards that are held almost daily at the Nick Gillespie apartment. And yet I never, I'm not even in the top five. I'm concerned <laughs> that you have a monopoly on those yeah. awards, Nick. Yeah. Somebody and I'm still, I don't know what goes wrong. This. I put, Lena, I stuffed the ballot Le- box. Lena Khan like, should probably look into yeah. the, the golfing awards at the, at the Trump <laughs> Uh Yeah, this is uh, the, the, 
Republican Party is getting what they deserve. I think the Democratic Party is getting what it deserves. And Matt, then what does where does that leave the four of us and many other people like us who are neither Republicans nor Democrats? Why are we getting what they deserve? That is, you know, that's the question, right? Well, not to we're spoil we're the getting next screwed. Segment. They're they're getting they're getting court decisions and they're getting more money and they're getting what of you know either a republican or a democrat is going to be uh you know the president what do we get you know we get the bill this is the four body problem yes uh would just uh uh point out that in um, studies of um populist love moments studies. internationally shush uh that uh uh, one of the things that you see, it's a common feature of uh, populist uh, uh, governments, is that a, a shockingly high percentage of uh, f- uh, former leaders uh, end up in prison. Like, uh, And this is like in dem- democratic countries as well. Um, and uh, I think it's an increasing thing that we're seeing worldwide. I think Sarkozy, Mike Nicolas Sarkozy, former French prime minister or president, uh, is, uh, uh, I think, uh, headed to or in prison right now. Really? Himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's like all kinds of court cases. I mean, that's pretty common also in French politics. Uh, once you bounce out of office, you're the subject of uh, either uh, like fantastical um, uh, mistress claims mm-hmm. <laughs> or uh, or legal proceedings. So uh, I it's... do like the. I mean, this is what keeps me on the internet, regardless of how I access it, whether it's an Apple or a, an Android product. Is the argument that Macron's wife was actually a man? Yes, that's uh, this very... was this led to the unpleasantness between Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens. Uh, I appreciate uh, you trying to uh, to throw that stink bomb near the end of the <laughs> podcast. Um, speaking of end of podcast stink bombs, let's go to what all of us were consuming in the cultural sphere. Uh, Peter, I'm kind of excited about what I think is yours. Why don't you lead us off? So I saw They Live on the big screen for the first time. I've obviously seen this movie many, many, many times before, uh, mostly just for the wrestling sequence in the middle of the movie that lasts so long. It's like it's it's basically like the the Joe Biden, Donald Trump uh, matchup, right? It's just these two old guys kind of slowly beating the crap out of each other in an alley for no good reason for forever. And it just keeps going. And by the end, you can't help but laugh. The whole movie is just so great in so many ways. But what really struck me about it, since I hadn't seen it all the way through in a few years, was that it is a great political time capsule. This movie is so populist, so pro-labor, anti-globalization, anti-mass media, anti-commercialism, just kind of anti-capitalism in general in a very explicit way where you've got an explicit uh, description of the bad guys coming from one of the kind of uh, lefty organizer types. Okay, he's an anti-aliens organizer, but he's really, he's just a lefty activist. And he's like, well, the bad guys, you know, they're free enterprisers, uh, right? And it's this wink-wink joke about um, how the bad guys, you know, call the good guys commies, but That's not true, obviously, right? Uh, And there's even like a black tie banquet scene that I'd forgotten about where it in the third act, you know, where our our hero Rowdy Roddy Piper wanders through the the television station and like the the bowels of the alien, uh, you know, sort of uh, operation. And they, they get to this black tie dinner and they refer to everybody there as the elites, right? And this was this was such an incredibly explicitly proudly left leaning film in its day. There's a there's a shot in this movie. So the premise is that uh, a, a kind of a drifter worker who's uh, who's doing some construction work uh, finds some glasses that allows him to see that that the world is actually run by a sort of alien um, overlords who are invisible to normal human eyes. And there's propaganda everywhere, right? Like all of the the signs for you know the magazines and the uh, the uh, it just billboards, everything. It all just says like obey and procreate and like, you know, sort of listen to authority. Don't think your own thoughts, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it, and so it, and then, of course, he goes and takes them down. Um, and, you know, so it's just interesting to see this as like, oh, this idea of the elites screwing the little guy, right? And kind of the, the populist types, um, that was that was there in the 1980s, except it was quite left-coded. In fact, like I said, there's a scene where our hero sees the television. He sees a politician who is almost certainly the president. We never see that it's Ronald Reagan, but it's pretty clearly implied that it's Ronald Reagan. He's just like, yeah, should have figured, you know? Um, and what's weird is watching this now, 
despite how left coded this this movie was at the time, um, watching this now, it actually feels like a kind of populist new right MAGA movie in so many ways, with maybe the exception of the way it treats sex and marriage and fertility. Um, but the movie is basically horseshoe theory in conspiratorial alien genre film uh, form. And it's 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 freaking great. I, I love John Carpenter, especially his run of movies in the 1980s. This is one of the best. If you can see it on the big screen, you should. Um, but it, as you do, just remember, this is a movie that sort of shows us the shifting nature of populist politics and how it has changed over the last 30 something years. Who uh, can I ask, Peter, uh, because, you know, the, it that's kind of one of the last big anti-Reagan pop culture manifestations who is Reagan in the current moment? Like, who are are there? Like, neither party kind of admits to being globalist, right? At this point, or or laissez faire, which is just—I mean, it's curious. I think that's right, though. You know, if you want a, a sort of a, a globalist Reagan type villain that uh, folks rally against, it's the sort of. The idea of the Paul Paul Ryan Republican Party, which still lingers on both the left and the right. Oh, they're going to cut your entitlements. Uh, they're going to do free trade, right? It's that maybe even the George W. Bush Republican Party and a huge amount of the MAGA new right worldview and the, to the extent that they have a, a policy agenda is about not doing the stuff that Paul Ryan and George W. Bush said they wanted to do in terms of trade and entitlements. I think your answer is George Soros, Nick. Uh, obviously. Uh, Catherine, what did you consume? Uh, speaking of views about fertility, I guess, um, I read uh, Tim Carney's new book, Family Unfriendly, How Our Culture Made Raising Kids Much Harder Than It Needs to Be. Um, I read it for a couple reasons. One, I'm a big Tim Carney fan, uh, as you should be as well. Uh, two, because I love that sweet, sweet confirmation bias. And almost everything in this book uh, comports with my pre-existing views. So take my review with that grain of salt. Um, I should also disclose that uh, I appear in this book. I am one of the uh, the characters in the book. I'm a parent that Tim interviewed uh, while he was working on the book. And um, the the part that quotes me is uh, it's a pandemic era. You know, he did the, the reporting of this book during the pandemic. It's a pandemic era kind of um, uh, celebration of the fact that the the pod that my family was in meant that the adults um, got to hang out and drink together a lot, which was super nice um, and is an undervalued part of kind of parenting as a part of a community. Um, so and fertility too. And uh, well, it depends on, yeah, how clear you need the the uh, lineages to be. Um, so the um, but the book is very good, not least because uh, it really is mostly about the culture. It really is not um, a book about how, you know, Josh Hawley is going to fix our problems. It's like maybe how we can fix our problems. And he's he is anti over parenting. He is anti over scheduling. He is pro having having maybe one extra kid beyond what you thought you wanted. And um, and all of these things just make for a good read. My final endorsement of this book is um, there is a uh, the cover has a picture of a, a playground slide on it. But I can only assume that this was a conscious choice. It's one of those old fashioned ones that are s the, the silver ones. Yeah. And when you look at it, you can just feel the backs of your thighs just burning as you slide down it like the sun is glinting off it. Um, and this is exactly the spirit of this book. It's like, you know what? Sometimes you just got to go to the park and slide down the slide that hurts you a little bit over and over because that's the best activity that's available. Um, that's true. And that's uh, that's a valuable parenting insight. So um, Tim Carney's Family Unfriendly. I recommend it if you want to somewhat counterbalance the utterly insane push on both left and right to have Congress fix our parenting problems. My um, one of my cousins, uh, when he had his third kid, um, I was asking him about uh, about uh, what it was like, uh, and he's like, "Well, we have to switch from uh, uh, playing man-to-man uh, -man defense to zone." And I uh, <laughs> and I often uh, he's a sports uh, doctor. Um, I often think about that um, as uh, like what are the ramifications of society and policy when it comes to that. Like, we grew up, uh, Nick and I, 
a thousand years ago where uh, um, that was, it was all zone defense and they were not interested in playing it. <laughs> they just didn't, they didn't parent um, was their solution. And it was kind of rad. Um, so um, yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm curious to see whether um, uh, Carney's uh, subhead is, uh, is like, I don't know, maybe six kids is a little bit too many. Um, he, uh, although, I will. I will go ahead and tell you, Matt. That is not his conclusion. He does yeah, not. He does yeah. not come to that conclusion. It's, but it's too uh, few, right? But you. Yeah, but he true. gives you the tools to make your own decisions about that's right. how many is too many. Appreciate me some Tim Carney. Uh, Nick, what did you consume? I watched the Netflix version of uh, and Peter. Help me with this. Lu Shijin's uh, three body problem. She's in Lu or Lu Shijin. Shijin. Lu. It's it's uh, depending right. on how you. I'm I'm probably mm -hmm. mispronouncing that too, but it depends on where you put the first last name situation. I'm going to call him Lu from here on out. But I watched uh, Netflix's Three Body Problem, which uh, is a mini series, and the, and the first season ostensibly. Uh, to a multi-season effort uh, about the three-body problem, which is a very highly regarded um, novel that came out of China uh, in 2007, I think, and then it was translated about a decade later, or eight years later. Um, it's fantastic, really good series, and it opens uh, with, it's, it's about a Chinese scientist, uh, along with some shadowy people in Ohio State who are never, sadly, are never shown, but who have actual contact with an alien race that is coming towards uh, uh, the Earth. But it opens which, with a scene from the Cultural Revolution, which is fantastic and highly worth watching. Just watch the first 10 minutes of this show. Um, the way that it figures what was going on in China during the Cultural Revolution is fantastic. And it sets a tone which is bizarre and wonderful throughout the whole thing of like, what do you do if you know that there is an alien race that is coming to conquer you in about 400 years? Um, and how does that play out in various kinds of ways? Uh, there are marked departures from the novel and things like that. But um, it's a really interesting and fascinating series. And one of the things that I was uh, doing a little background on, Lou, the author, um, was pilloried for not speaking out against the way that the Chinese government deals with the Uyghurs and other populations at various points. Um, and he has he has kind of claimed to be apolitical. He did go along with moving that scene from the Cultural Revolution from the middle of the novel to the beginning for the English translation and, and for the American market, which is kind of interesting. But he is on the record of saying, if you were to loosen up the country, China a little bit, the consequences would be terrifying. Uh, he has said that democracy is not good for modern China for a variety of reasons. Um, and what's Interesting beyond the fact that he's talking, you know, he's coming out of a Chinese uh, connection. When Netflix talked about this deal in 2020, four Republican senators uh, wrote a letter to Netflix demanding that Netflix say that they are against the Uyghur imprisonment. And what are they doing? Like, you know, they had to, they were supposed to answer why they were pursuing a deal with a text like this by a person like that, which is kind of interesting. And the four senators, uh, Marsha Blackburn, Rick Scott, Tom Tillis of North Carolina, Matt. And then I want to ask you, especially, Matt, the mm. fourth senator was Kevin Kramer. Do you have mm. any idea what state he is from? Sounds like a Dakota. <laughs> that is uh, actually perfect. Yeah, he's North Dakota. I When I saw Kevin Kramer, I was like, I think I went to grammar school <laughs> with like six Wait. Kevin Kramers. Am I having deja vu or is this the second time we've speculated about whether Kevin Kramer is real on this podcast? I don't know. It may be we're might, in some kind of time loop from a different Netflix Are series. Are we wearing the sunglasses but, or not? Yeah. yeah. It no, but it um it's uh you know, it's it's a really good series. It would have been so beautiful during the pandemic, actually, because it, it has that kind of vibe to it. But it's a it's a really incredibly well done um in many ways the characters are frustrating the large scenario is really kind of mesmerizing and things like that so uh the three body problem and it's i don't you know it's like eight hours long or something and i watched it in like a day and a half because it's 
It's that good. So I'm only a couple of episodes into the show, but I wrote about the books for Reason Magazine several years ago when they came out. And one of the interesting things about the, that book is the way that it uses that opening sequence with the in the Cultural Revolution. It is a sequence about a physics professor who is being told that he's teaching basically capitalist physics, right? Physics that doesn't support the will of the people and the you know the Chinese, and he's being told to recant what he knows to be fundamentally true about the physical world. And this is in many to so in some ways this sets up the plot of oh physics is just broken it suddenly doesn't work the same way it does anymore. And I think if you read a little bit deep, more deeply into the books what you see is that the books are about they are about this idea that sometimes like governments and popul and movements and and politics force you to say things that you know are not true and that that is a survival mechanism and that it's terrible but the way that you survive is by holding in your head the truth that you that that is real the thing that is objectively actually true and that even if you're not going to say it that like you have to hold that in your head and that is how you survive and it's really kind of interesting seeing that coming from somebody who is uh, in you know uh, CCP China um, and uh, I think the book is more secretly subversive than a lot of people have given it credit for one hopes it uh, Matt, your interests in you know in uh, kind of uh, uh, the Eastern Eastern Bloc politics under communism, you'll find a lot. Uh, it, it's a very rich text for that. And the opening scene is the father is the professor who, who is asked to recant because he believes in the Big Bang, which implies there was something before time began. And then the the young interlocutor who beats him to death, I'm not giving anything away here, is saying that you are opening up a space where God exists and God cannot exist. I mean, it's it's just wonderfully done, but his wife is the one who denounces him on stage. And then the daughter who becomes the main kind of catalyst in the in the plot is in the audience watching this. It's 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 really, really well done because like Peter, like you're saying, it's trying to hold multiple beliefs at the same time. But then what is the effect on people who live under that system, especially when then they have some space for autonomy or freedom? What kind of decisions do they make? It's it's very good. So my uh consumption is what if I told you that last year there was a movie uh, about uh, the uh, Philip Marlowe character, um, Raymond Chandler's classic L.A. noir detective character that uh, was played by Liam Neeson and that the movie was directed by Neil Jordan and that other people involved included Jessica Lange. All of this happened last year. It's a movie no called Marlowe. No one saw this movie. Uh, and no one watched it <laughs> at all. It's got like, uh, the, you know, they made $12 and uh, and got a, a, an abysmal uh, Rotten Tomatoes uh, ranking. I didn't know any of that when I um, mashed the please play this button because it was Philip Marlowe and it's L.A. Um, and of course, I enjoyed it. And I'm interested in, in that fact. Um, for those who like uh, L.A. Uh, noir um, I don't know if you like this, but for those who absolutely need to keep some Philip Marlowe into their veins at periodic times as a basic survival instinct, even more than holding in some truth that you're afraid to blurt out, um, it's just there for you. It's like inscrutable plot involving, you know, shady Mexicans and Hollywood starlets and power structures that don't make sense and corrupt cops and the whiskey and all that. Uh, it's it's not even uh, based on a Chandler book. Uh, it's based on a a novel that came out recently, I guess, called The Black Eyed Blonde. Um, and but it's all just familiar, totally like you know, it, like an unfollowable Raymond Chandler plot. Um, and, uh, and a lot of literary references, uh, Neeson is a bit older, uh, than you usually get as a Philip Marlowe He's a little bit more kind of frail and sad, um, uh, a bit of, a, a more emphasis on the Irishness, which is kind of interesting and kind of, uh, uh, the wartime service and the memories and hauntings of that. Um, it's, it's not great. And it's also, uh, super awesome and i i loved all of it and uh and so if you're that kind of person you might like it too uh you'll be outnumbered by everybody else but it's called marlo um that's with an e everybody um and uh check it out if you like that kind of stuff i saw it on amazon it's probably elsewhere um all right that's all the uh, uh elsewhere we have time for here on the reason uh, roundtable podcast nick are there any tickets left for the jonathan height event that you are having at the reason speakeasy on april 15th in new york city uh yes 
That's good news. Uh, go out there and get- reason.com slash events and uh, buy the last ticket. Uh, and if you like our podcasts, and you should, there's lots of them now. Uh, go to reason.com uh, slash podcast to get the full uh, uh, view. If you like what we do, please go to reason.com slash donate. Consider giving us a tax deductible donation uh, to encourage us to do more. All right. That's all the time we have. Uh, we will see you next week. And goodbye.